Well, welcome to uh, Golden Prairie for our second virtual hike this year. Um, the first one we did in uh, kind of late spring. And so we saw what the prairie looked like then, some of the plants that were out and some of them that were on their way out. Um, so we're back to um, take a look at what the same area looks like at the pretty much at the end of the growing season. So we'll see some of the, the fall blooming wild flowers we'll see some of them that um, what's left from plants that we did see before uh, certainly the whole prairie will look quite a bit different because before it had recently been um, or it still hadn't grown back from the last prescribed burn this last winter but now the grasses are getting nice and tall again and you can see why it's called a tall grass prairie as you get farther to the west uh, there's not as much rain and the prairie grasses don't get this tall and those are short mid grass prairies but um, so welcome here to um, Golden Prairie. Golden Prairie is one of the Missouri Prairie Foundation's earliest um, acquisitions. Um, the remnant prairie here, the the really good main part of Golden Prairie is 320 acres, and it was acquired in 1970 mostly and then a little bit added on in 1974. So uh, those two purchases make up the the 320 acres of the good remnant prairie that we're on here. Um, it has been recognized um, uh, for the quality of this prairie as both a national natural landmark designated by the National Park Service back in 1975 and then more recently uh, these 320 acres have been designated as a Missouri State Natural Area. If you happen to see Mike Leahy's webinar a couple weeks ago he talked about the natural area system and Golden Prairie uh, was included in that system a few years ago so it's a designated Missouri State Natural Area by the the Missouri Natural Areas Committee as well as a National Natural Landmark and we have this prairie here today um, uh, largely because of the previous owners um, it was the Pew family and Lowell Pew um, who uh, was involved in the Missouri Prairie Foundation for many years but long before that he grew up on uh, this prairie this was part of his family farm and so uh, he became very interested in protecting prairies he became one of the leading prairie conservationists in southwestern Missouri uh, he was uh, instrumental with the Missouri Prairie Foundation and so his family sold us this 320 acre prairie back in the 70s. Since that time we have actually added um, about 310 acres to that but that's mostly either uh, old crop field which has been reconstructed into prairie to reconstructed prairie or, uh, or much more degraded remnant prairie not the quality of this original 320 acres but their whole complex here is uh, 630 acres that the prairie foundation owns uh, it's considered a dry mesic sandstone shale prairie um, it's basically sandstone is what uh, the main um, bedrock formation here is for this prairie and so it's a, a good example of that kind of natural community. Um, we're actually still in the Ozark Highlands. We're not yet in the Osage Plains. This area is still in the Ozark Highlands, but it's a portion of it called the Springfield Plains, which was ex which had extensive prairies uh, before Euro-American settlement, and um, does still have, fortunately, at least a few nice remnants that we have left in in this area. When you look inside this little jar here, you can see some of the, the little things that kind of make the prairie go. Uh, there are things we oftentimes overlook when we're walking through the prairie, um, all these tiny insects and invertebrates, but uh, they're some of the key components out here in this uh, prairie community. In fact, probably there's like a whole food web uh, inside this little jar because some of the insects <clears throat> 
are herbivores that are eating the plants. There's predatory ones. Uh, there are some spiders in there, which of course are predators. And so these are all key components to the prairie community, just parts that are often overlooked. Uh, besides uh, many of the insects being herbivores, which are basically, they're eating the plants and turning the plant material into animal material, which then feeds uh, many other animals, including our grassland birds and, and uh, many of the other animals. But uh, there are also uh, many insects out here on the prairie are also important pollinators. Uh, and when we have things in flower, um, oftentimes you can find an abundance of the pollinators coming to, to those flowering plants. And in some cases, uh, some of the insects are very specialized. Uh, this wildflower here, which is typical of prairies late in the summer, is um, blue sage and there is actually a uh, um, bee in Missouri called the blue sage bee that uh, gathers pollen just from this particular species. So uh, in many cases there's very intricate uh, relationships between some of the the plants out here and then some of the insects or some of the pollinators. Uh, certain beetles will only feed on one or a few different kinds of plants and nothing else. So there are a lot of very intricate relationships out here on that kind of scale. So here we have a couple of the classic uh, fall prairie plants, um, goldenrods, or uh, some of the some of the goldenrods at least. And so here we have one called rigid goldenrod, a really pretty one for a goldenrod. It's got uh, much larger yellow flowers than than many of them do, um, and then it's got a, a stem that's kind of rough feeling, and the leaves are kind of rough feeling, but it has this very distinctive kind of flat-topped appearance, the way the, the inflorescence comes up, and, and so you get a very uh, flat-topped appearance to the, to the flower head. Uh, then when we step over here, we can see um, one of the really remnant dependent uh, species of goldenrods, one of the nicer ones to have around, and also uh, a very showy one, which is appropriately called showy goldenrod. Um, it also has, for goldenrods, kind of larger flowers than most of them do, um, again, making it probably a little bit prettier. Uh, but this one, the stem is perfectly smooth, the leaves are smooth, uh, the leaves uh, just kind of get smaller as you go up the stem from larger basal leaves. So uh, this is the showy goldenrod, which uh, since it's one of the more remnant dependent ones is a really good one to find out here. So these are a couple of typical fall bloomers. As we talked about uh, when we did the hike in the spring, uh, throughout the season you're going to get a change in what's in flower here. So uh, at any one time you come out, you're only going to see a, a subset of what's out here in bloom. Uh, some bloom early, some bloom middle of summer, some bloom late. So the golden rods typically are some of the later ones, uh, but there are still there is still signs of a lot of the earlier ones out here. Uh, either just the plants themselves or in many cases uh, you can now see their seeds or remnants of their seeds which uh, can help you um, identify them. So if we come right over here, this is goat's rue. Uh, goat's rue is in the legume family. Uh, when it flowers during the summer uh, it gets uh, very large sort of pea-like flowers that are two-toned, uh, part kind of yellow and part pink, very pretty uh, large pea-like flower. It's got these dissected leaves and when uh, it goes to seed, it has these pods that as they open up kind of twist or curl, uh, so it's got these very distinctive seed pods on it. Now, looking very similar to the, the goat's rue, but another uh, really good remnant dependent species is lead plant that you can see right here. And the lead plant is very similar looking and sometimes they can be uh, 
kind of difficult to tell apart or you have to really study them up close uh, because the foliage does look very similar. Uh, lead plant is actually uh, kind of considered a woody shrub. It, it does have a woody base and in years when there's no disturbance like caying or burning, um, it can get quite a bit bigger because of the, the woody stem it has. When it was in flower, the flowers are totally different looking than the, the goat's rue. The flowers are tiny little purple flowers, almost like little purple cylinders, uh, which I believe is actually like one of the petals that forms kind of the little purple cylinder. And then you can see the bright yellow stamen sticking out. So it's really pretty flowers, kind of deep purple with the, the yellow tips. But you they are very small and you do have to get down close to, to really see them in detail. But this is what it looks like when the lead plant goes to, goes to seed. So again, quite different. Uh, the plants, the foliage itself is very similar, but uh, the flowers and then when you see it in seeds, there's a, a big difference between the lead plant and the goat's rue. And again, this is really one of the very good remnant dependent um, uh, species we have. Lead plant is a pretty classic uh, prairie plant, probably called lead plant because it's got a dense hairiness that gives a foliage kind of this grayish color that you notice. And so it's kind of a, a lead color and that may be where it got the name lead plant. Okay, we're really fortunate here that um, one of our more summer flowers, uh, but a few of them are still hanging on and, and a couple of them still have flowers left. And this is one of them, the fringed poppy mallow. Um, it's a, a beautiful flower um, and is found on a number of our prairies here in southwest Missouri. Um, besides being the fringed poppy mallow, some people also call it wine cup. Uh, because with just kind of the shape and the color of it, it does look like a kind of the shape of a cup full of, of red wine. So um, this is the fringe poppy mallow. This is a good remnant dependent species on the zero to 10 score. Uh, we uh, talk about uh, this one, I believe is a nine. So it's a, a really good remnant dependent species. Another one, another remnant dependent species, which is more typical this time of year on the prairie, is the sky blue aster or azure aster. And so this one, small, little, beautiful, bright blue flowers. And the stem itself is, is kind of sandpapery or sort of rough feeling. And so this is another uh, good remnant dependent species. Then we also have a couple other species here. Um, this one is one of the desmodiums, one of the tick tree foils. This is sessile leaf tick tree tick tree foil, which is a good characteristic um, uh, prairie plant. And uh, while it flowered during the summer, you can see its seeds, which are the things that they've always called them beggar's lice. They're the seeds that will stick to your clothes. I've got a lot of them stuck to my pants right now. So um, this is the, the tick tree foil. And um, it can, I believe, um, be pretty good food for uh, some wildlife, some of the birds in that, the seeds inside. And um, it's certainly got a, a very efficient way of spreading itself around. I know I've spread lots and lots of seeds of, of this and other tick tree foils over the years. Okay, here we have uh, a couple more of our remnant dependent uh, plant species, which we always like to see uh, these species because uh, with them growing here, they just don't tolerate too much human disturbance. So um, to find them growing here uh, is telling us that this is a high quality prairie natural community that has never been plowed and, and um, is a good, stable, intact old growth prairie. This one here is one called rough white lettuce with these sort of real pretty cream colored flowers. And 
Uh, this is one that, like many of the plants here, um, the Native Americans that have lived here for thousands of years, uh, this and many of these plants are ones that they uh, did use. Uh, medicinally, they used them. So um, it's kind of interesting sometimes to take a look at how things were used culturally in the past. Uh, today, we think of them mostly as something, you know, beautiful for us to see. Um, or we tend to think of them for maybe their ecological uh, reasons. But the people that lived out here on the prairie for thousands of years, a lot of these plants were literally very crucial to them uh, for food, for medicine, things like that. Uh, same kind of thing with this one, uh, which is, uh, of course, again, past flower now. But this is purple prairie clover. Uh, there's two kinds of prairie clovers that are uh, typical of our prairies. The white one has a little bit larger leaves than this, and on the purple one, these leaves uh, are very f are broken down into very fine little segments. And so this, we can tell uh, even past flower that this is the purple prairie clover. So midsummer, uh, just beautiful bright purple flower clusters, small flowers on uh, the top of the stem. Now it's gone to seed, but um, this again is one of the, the good indicator prairie uh, or remnant dependent species that we have here. Okay, last time we were out here in the prairie um, in kind of uh, late spring, and this part of the prairie had been burnt off like we need to do to maintain the prairie. Uh, it was burnt off last winter, and when we were here before, most of the grasses were still pretty small. They were pretty inconspicuous. Uh, you could see real easily across the landscape, um, but uh, our main prairie grasses are what are called warm season grasses. And so as opposed to many kind of grasses, and a lot of times the grasses people grow in their lawns and, and that, um, that grow better in cool seasons, the prairie grass, the main prairie grasses, there's cool season grasses out here, but the main prairie grasses are warm season grasses. So they grow best during the hotter part of the, the summer. So when we were here before, there wasn't, you know, too much of the grasses to see. They were very, sh you know, the regrowth this year had been very short, was still very short. Now they've taken off. Um, and so you can see now it really looks like, or you can see why it's called a tall grass prairie. Of the prairie grasses out here, there's sort of three main types. Uh, one of them is little blue stem which you can see right here. A uh, little blue stem gets these kind of wispy uh, seed, uh, kind of wispy lines of seeds coming out and kind of arching from the side of the stem. And with the name little blue stem, it's got a shorter stature than some of the other ones. It also really shows up very well as we get a little bit more into the fall. Um, we tend to think of fall colors as being in the woods, not so much out in grasslands, but um, uh, little blue stem uh, kind of cures to a, a really pretty sort of wine red color. So it can be really distinctive and add a, a nice touch of color to the prairie as we go through the fall. So <clears throat> we just saw a little blue stem. Now here's big blue stem, which in stature does get uh, quite a bit taller. And big blue stem is also very distinctive when it gets its flowers or when the flowers then uh, turn into seeds because they tend to form in long, narrow little spikes that are joined kind of at the base. So you get this sort of prong look or oftentimes you'll get sort of like three prongs, which kind of reminded people in the past of a bird's foot or a turkey foot. And so big blue stem also was frequently referred to as old turkey foot uh, because of this, this arrangement. So we have little blue stem, which is very abundant. Big blue stem, which is really abundant on our tall grass prairies, and it can get much taller than this. This is about five and a half feet tall. I can see others that are probably six and seven feet tall, and in a wet year and right situation, it can be nine or 10 feet tall. Here's the, like the third of our uh, 
sort of main warm season prairie grasses. Uh, this one is Indian grass. And unlike like the big blue stem that's got the, the kind of prong-like look to the, to the flowers and the seeds, on Indian grass, it just kind of looks like a plume or a feather-like top on the stem of the, the grass. Um, so quite distinctive looking from the other ones. And usually it's kind of in between in, in stature. It can be a little bit taller, sometimes about as tall as a big blue stem, but usually it's not quite as tall as big blue stem, but it's usually bigger than little blue stem. But easy to tell when it's in flower like the other ones because of the arrangement of the flowers and the seeds. But on the Indian grass, you can also get an idea that that's what it is during the, uh, or earlier in the season, because when you, uh, kind of pull the base of the leaf blade away from the stem there's kind of a little tooth that sticks up that one broke off we'll see if and so that little tooth that sticks up right from the the base of the leaf blade uh, that's distinctive on the Indian grass and will help you recognize it um, earlier in the season when it hasn't uh, got the flowers or the seeds yet So here kind of nestled among the, the big blue stem and uh, in with the showy goldenrod, um, we have uh, what some people consider maybe the, the prettiest of the uh, prairie fall asters. This one, which is called um, Southern Bog Aster or Slimleaf Bog Aster, um, has these bright blue, um, uh, ray flowers, just a really pretty plant. It doesn't get very tall, uh, so if it's not in flower, it would be difficult to, to pick it out here in the, the taller grasses this time of year. But um, when you see it in flower like this, it's just a, a beautiful aster to have here. And also, again, another one of the really good remnant-dependent species. Uh, this one on the, the 0 to 10 scale is a 9. So this is, um, so we have this system uh, that botanists and ecologists have uh, described for um, giving a one to, giving a zero to 10 score for each of our native plants on kind of how faithful it is to a native remnant landscape. And so uh, plants that are kind of, uh, they kind of thrive on disturbance. Even native plants that thrive on disturbance would have a low value like a zero, one, two, or three. And then kind of the matrix plants, uh, they're not totally maybe restricted to uh, a high quality remnant site, but they're part of that system. They're a big part, they're kind of the matrix of a stable remnant uh, prairie community. And then we have the uh, ones that are like 7, 8, 9, and 10. And we call these ecologically conservative species or remnant dependent species. So these are ones that uh, don't tolerate um, too much uh, the wrong kinds of uh, especially human induced disturbances. And so when you find them, it's virtually always on a remnant prairie or a remnant natural habitat. If it's been, you know, greatly disturbed, they're not going to be there anymore. They're probably not going to come back because uh, they're largely missing in the surrounding landscapes. And so um, we have them here indicating or telling us kind of the ecological history of the site that if you find those, you know it's been a prairie. But that's not but not everything out here is dependent on it being a remnant. So we have ones like the, the pale purple cone flower. This is a good remnant dependent species. Um, so this one, one tells us that it's a, a prairie. Uh, the purple prairie clover here, another remnant dependent species. So we have all these, these high C value plants, which is very important to show that this is um, a remnant prairie. 
but there are the other plants out here too. So like this uh, thistle is like a three or a four. Uh, the oxeye is maybe about a five. Uh, so a lot of what you see out here are plants that are in that matrix range, but there are also, even out on a, a remnant prairie, you will find a few of the, the kind of disturbance plants out here because there are little disturbances and that going on. So they are part of the system, but we also uh, want those remnant dependent species here to know that this is a good remnant prairie. It's never been plowed or that in the past. It is a good remnant prairie that we're conserving here and it has those very unique species that really need that uh, in order to survive. It's kind of interesting to see this little one in flower now. This is violet wood sorrel, which is usually a pretty common sight in uh, our prairies in the spring. It's typically uh, a fairly early spring blooming wildflower, but uh, there are a few plants that will flower typically in the spring, but sometimes will flower again in the fall. And this is one that uh, some sometimes does it. So uh, a spring flower, but typically, but it does sometimes show up again in, in the fall. And then right over here, we have one of our really uh, common sort of classic uh, prairie wildflowers, rosin weed. And it has a, a yellow sunflower-like flower. Uh, but um, rosin weed is in the same genus and is closely related to a uh, compass plant and a couple others like cup plant and prairie dock and, <clears throat> and typical of that group of plants is that when you look at their flower the center part only the outer ridge only the outer ring of flowers is fertile the flowers in the middle are all sterile and never produce any seeds. So when you go to like collect seeds from it, um, the middle part is all just kind of chaff and there won't be any seeds in there. And you get just a ring of kind of flattened seeds around the outside edge. <clears throat> in this case, all the, the middle part, the kind of chaff, has already fallen away and you can see just the ring of seeds these flat seeds uh, around the outside edge. So that's typical of rosin weed, but also compass plant and just the other couple members of the uh, Silphium genus. And here we have a, a really nice one. This is American Blue Hearts. And American Blue Hearts are really interesting because they're, uh, again, one of the plants out here that is partially parasitic. So its roots uh, can get nutrients from some of the surrounding plants. It's still green and so it's not a total parasite but it is uh, a partially parasitic plant and now they're put into a family of plants that uh, um, constitutes pretty much all the ones that are uh, parasitic or partially parasitic like this one and it's also a really nice one to find here because on our uh, 0 to 10 scale American Blue Hearts is a 10. So, um, so this is, a, again, another really good one to have here, showing uh, this being, um, with this being a remnant-dependent species, indicating a, a good remnant prairie. We have a nice little grouping of things here, uh, kind of working up our scale. We do have um, a downy sunflower or ashy sunflower. So this is a, a really abundant species out here and in, in many prairies. So earlier in the summer it had uh, the really nice big uh, sunflower-like flower on it. And so it's like... Um, um, one of the matrix species out here. Another one being this one, the prairie blazing star. So this is kind of a highlight for many people during the summer uh, because these whole spikes can be covered in tiny little purple flowers that gives the just the whole top of the stem this bright purple appearance. And so it's one of the really showy uh, summer um, uh, wildflowers out here on our prairies. And 
Uh, another characteristic one, oftentimes at about the same time, is Rattlesnake Master. And Rattlesnake Master is a really interesting plant. It's actually in the carrot family, although the leaves almost look like yuccas because there's little projections on the side of these long, thin, sort of sword-like and succulent-feeling leaves. Um, but it's uh, not related to yuccas at all. It's, uh, like I say, in the carrot family, these characteristic um, uh, kind of spherical flower heads with the with small little sort of greenish white flowers on top um, this is one that um, is again a remnant dependent species this one I believe is an, an eight and rattlesnake master was also used a lot it was used um, uh, medicinally by uh, Native Americans and then it's also was used to make uh, cordage and so I believe there have been like sandals found in Missouri in archaeologic sites made from cordage from this rattlesnake master and then kind of a prairie gem for many people and the highlight of fall on the prairies is finding the downy gentian and these uh, downy gentians are just this beautiful deep blue um, you never notice the plant if it wasn't in flower because it's doesn't get very big and so down here in in uh, thicker uh, late summer fall vegetation without the flowers you you just never find it but when you see it in flower just a, a gorgeous plant and this one also um, a really good remnant dependent plant is a, a nine Okay, um, we have kind of an interesting little find here. This small little purplish flower, uh, an interesting one. It's not just like a, a prairie plant. It likes kind of open areas, but in, uh, in a number of different habitats. But this one uh, is called clammy kufia. And if you feel the stem, there's little glandular hairs on it that give it just a real sticky feeling. So it's really notable because of that sticky feeling you get when touching touching the plant. So this is clammy kufia and as it turns out this one is new to our list for um, for Golden Prairie. So even with the uh, over 300 and about 320 species on the list um, we're still finding occasionally new species out here. Uh, on our spring walk we found a couple new species and um, it looks like this one is a new one for the list and so we're still adding. Bright purple here is uh, ironweed and this one is um, seems to be the good prairie one called uh, uh, like curly topped uh, ironweed which is a remnant dependent species. There are a couple kinds of ironweed but this is the most uh, prairie uh, dependent one and then also around here we have lots of the seed heads from gray headed cone flower and the gray headed cone flower is not an echinacea like the uh, like the pale purple uh, this is a retibita but um, it does have when it's in flower the the ray flowers the petals will droop down uh, hence the name cone flower forms kind of like a cone and uh, this is what it looks like in seed and when you break the seed apart it also has kind of a pleasant smell. Uh, I know this is one that is uh, frequently uh, very common in uh, plantings and, uh, and in reconstructions. Now we're kind of down in a little um, uh, prairie swale, which is um, uh, kind of the low spot where water will drain off the prairie. It's like doesn't hold water enough to be really considered a stream, but it is a drainage way through the prairie that does stay moister than the upland and drier sites. And so as a result, there's different things that you can find down here. Uh, the classic grass you find in prairie swales and in wet prairies in Missouri is 
cord grass and this is cord grass this is it um, with the the seed heads on it so that's what that looks like um, you can also tell it if you uh, very carefully start to rub your hand like down on the leaves uh, you'll feel the roughness which would could just slice your skin wide open um, that's why cord grass is also sometimes referred to as rip gut uh, you have to be careful walking through it because the the little projections on the side of the leaves um, if you get the if you're kind of going against the grain um, they they will really slice you so this is characteristic of the bottomland prairies uh, the characteristic grass but there are uh, a number of characteristic forbs or wildflowers down here too there's the sneeze weed um, real pretty the yellow flowers and the ends of the like petals on the ray flowers have kind of indentations it's characteristic there's a purple headed sneeze weed you find up in drier parts of the prairie earlier in the summer and then this one is um, usually in like the late summer and and into the fall um, with uh, yellow centers to it and then um, right over here is a plant called bone set um, and this is a plant that apparently was used extensively for medicinal reasons uh, in uh, for the Native Americans but then for later colonists and and that too so bone set again it's typically found in the swales or the wetter areas on the prairies and um, was a, a very important medicinal plant we also have here uh, swamp agrimony during the summer it had all these were small little yellow flowers and now it's going to seed but it's typical of these wetter areas and then the shrubs you see right over here are indigo bush and indigo bush is a close relative of lead plant the same genus as lead plant but this one tends to get a little bit taller it also is really much just like the the swales or wetter areas like this and you don't find it up in uh, in most of the the prairie but um, the leaves look like lead plant and the flowers when it flowers it's got the little uh, sort of tubular purple flowers with the yellow stamens just like the the lead plant does uh, we're really fortunate to see this uh, beautiful um, golden garden spider they seem to have quite a few common names yellow garden spider golden garden spider uh, um, it's I th also called RGOP, which I think is the genus for this group of spiders, but uh, they're really notable. Um, I believe they're one of our largest, uh, at least orb weaving spiders, but they are one of them that make the beautiful spir um, spider webs. This one uh, is a little more closed in and characteristically they have kind of a, a bright white zigzag uh, strip of silk through it um, called the stablementum which um, I don't think anybody's quite sure exactly why the garden spiders put that on their web I think it might be to kind of tighten it up maybe it's to keep maybe it's a uh, kind of allow birds to see it so they don't fly into the web but anyway this one doesn't have it but um, but there's no mistaking the the spider itself uh, they're like I say one of our largest ones out here very brightly colored I believe all these larger ones you see are females that the males are actually very small so when you see these nice big spiders on the webs uh, that those are going to be the the females but a very striking uh, spider and um, also this one shows their uh, predatory behavior very well uh, looks like it's feeding on a grasshopper that got caught in its web and grasshoppers are really abundant out here right now so um, so it's very appropriate for the the garden spider to have got one in its web and and be feeding on it now
in the spring we uh, got to see a uh, blue wild indigo and here it is now so uh, it appears that this one had successfully you know the flowers were successful and it's produced fruit and uh, so there should be some seeds inside these these pods so um, this is what's left of the the blue indigo we saw in the spring but at that time we didn't see some of these other plants that have come up around it so um, we now have some of the uh, grass leaf goldenrod um, in a different genus from the other golden rods it used to be uh, I guess a true golden rod and now it's in a, a different genus but it's still called the uh, grass leaf golden rod uh, this little hat this little aster uh, white heath aster and then we also have some mountain mint uh, this is slender mountain mint there's some of it scattered all around through here again uh, this is usually a very good plant for um, insect pollinators during the summer when it's in flower uh, but now it's going to seed and it turns kind of blackish like this when um, when the seed heads are getting ripe and there would be little seeds inside there A real classic plant of swales and kind of wettish areas out in uh, prairies is a sawtooth sunflower. Uh, sawtooth sunflowers are ones that can grow to be extremely large. Uh, this is a good size one, but they even get quite a bit taller than this. Uh, real pretty uh, yellow sunflower flowers on, on top of them. Uh, but then this big long stem, the stem is real smooth, the leaves are pretty smooth. And uh, so this is um, a plant that you typically find in these swale type habitats. And then um, we've just discovered, this is what um, uh, we think is, I believe it's called orange cone flower. It's uh, Rudbeckia, or it's in the genus with black-eyed Susans and sweet cone flower, but this is not one of those. We think it's one called um, um, Rudbeckia fulgida, which, if so, would be another new species for the prairie. So uh, we're still continuing even today to find uh, new species for uh, golden prairie to add to the, the overall plant list. Beneath the sneeze weed and the bone set here in this part of the swale, you can also see the bright blue flowers of uh, this lobelia. It's uh, called grape blue lobelia, or uh, it's sometimes even called blue cardinal flower, because these flowers are um, in the same genus. They're very closely related to cardinal flower, uh, which is a very striking red uh, colored flower, and this one is blue. Uh, so this is uh, the great blue lobelia or blue cardinal flower. So far today, um, as last time, we talked about adding a few new plant species to our list for the prairies. Um, and that kind of brings up the topic of sort of inventory and research. And so the Prairie Foundation is very interested in learning more about our prairie and other, and other native grassland communities um, and using our prairies for uh, especially sort of non-invasive uh, research and inventory to try and learn more about uh, the prairies that we own but then also use it to expand our knowledge of the whole prairie ecosystem uh, with hopefully the idea of uh, more information will allow us to protect more of the grasslands um, as we discover their benefits in that and can pass that on and then uh, to better take care of, of uh, these little treasures. So uh, Golden Prairie is a good example. We have done over the, the years, we have done many different uh, projects out here. Um, we of course try and keep uh, an inventory on the plant species 
we find here. Uh, it started out with a very good uh, comprehensive plant survey by Doug Ladd of the Nature Conservancy in the late 1990s. He surveyed all the Missouri Prairie Foundation prairies at that time. So that gave us a very good basic list to work from. And so now we just, when we do find something additional, we just add it onto the list. But then we have in more recent years also done uh, more precise uh, ecological monitoring um, that was done by uh, Justin Thomas and the Institute of Botanical Training uh, ecological um, integrity uh, survey that's been done on many of our prairies but uh, Golden Prairie was one of our first ones for doing that um, and then through the years whenever we've had opportunities uh, surveys have been done here on breeding birds uh, on the grassland breeding birds on uh, community health, community health index. We've had surveys on the herps of Golden Prairie, the reptiles and amphibians, on uh, bees and odinates or dragonflies and damselflies. We have had surveys done on the, the little headwater streams found here, the aquatic resources, including the macro invertebrates, the kind of larger invertebrates that you find in streams. So, um, and then more recently, there have been some surveys done on the soils of the prairie, on small mammals. So uh, we have done uh, surveys and inventory projects on many aspects of uh, the prairie ecosystem here. And we hope to continue and uh, we like to try and work with, um, with people that are in the field that are interested in doing research and inventory and uh, providing them some of the, the um, sort of field laboratories to, to work in to try and learn more about this ecosystem.